Welcome back to the Discount Property Investor Podcast. Our mission is to share what we have learned from our experience and the experience of others to help you make more money investing like a pro. We want to teach you how to create wealth by investing in real estate the Discount Property Investor way. To jumpstart your real estate investing career, visit FreeWholesaleCourse.com, the most complete free course on wholesaling real estate ever. Thanks for tuning in. All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of the Discount Property Investor Podcast. I am your host, David Dodge. Today, I have Mr. Vlad Arakchev here today to talk to you all about real estate investing. Now, Vlad is an active investor. He is a co-sponsor and JV partner in 500 plus multifamily units and land development deals uh, amounting to multi-million dollars worth of real estate. Vlad is in charge of Zontic Ventures um, Operations and Asset Management, and he is also a member of the National Real Estate Investor Network. Vlad, welcome to the show, my man. How are you today? Uh, thanks so much. I really, really look forward to this. Uh, really excited to be here. Well, we're happy to have you, man. So give us a little bit of a background on who is Vlad and you know how you got started investing in real estate. Yeah, I started just in a completely crazy way. Uh, it happened during COVID. Um, I was a graphic designer for, I don't know, 15 years before that. Had a great job, five minutes away from my house. COVID hit, I got furloughed. And uh, I didn't know when or where my next paycheck is coming from. You know, I got to pay the mortgage. I have a, you know, a house, a uh, kids, family, you know, wife, got to know and uh, had to make a change. So my wife suggested, so I tried to be a real estate agent. And uh, um, even though I got called back uh, to my uh, W-2, I was studying at night to be a realtor here in New Jersey. And I got my real estate license, started selling some houses slowly, um, uh, on the weekends and stuff like that. And then I started going to a few meetups and I was exposed to uh, fix and flips and wholesaling. And I started doing that little by little. Okay. Um, all in New Jersey, local to your, all in to your neighborhoods and whatnot. Yeah. Bergen okay. County, North Jersey. I, I, you know, that that's what I thought I had to be. I have to be local. I could not go anywhere else. I didn't know how. And then, we wanted to get some passive income. So we got a single family rental here in Jersey. It was netting a thousand dollars a month, a thousand, which is awesome. Wow. Yeah. And why I'm saying was because we sold it two months ago. It's uh, May now. So we sold it, I guess, like February. Okay. Um, I, why did you I, sell I, it? I huh? Why did you guys sell it? Uh, you know what? Even though it was good, but it was just too much of a headache. It was distracting me from my goal of being in multifamily. In addition, I was managing the place. And uh, I was I received I started receiving calls of chasing raccoons off the roof, unclogging toilets. Then there is like a infestation of something in there. And I'm yep. like, no, I'm not dealing with this. So <laughs> I, I'm done. It was it was too distracting and the requests were uh, just too silly. One of the requests was the toilet is not filling up fast enough. And after that, I'm like, OK, I'm done with single family space. Can't do it anymore. And, yeah. uh, um, and how long did you own for, it? How long? Three years. Three years. OK, got it. Yeah. We went to a multifamily event in Houston and my eyes were opened on multifamily space and the potential of multifamily. And when mm -hmm. we came back here to New Jersey, uh, we needed mentorship. We needed education. And we joined Jake and Gino. It's a, a multifamily. No, I know who they are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Multifamily community. And we got a lot of education and of course, networking because when it comes to buying uh, multifamily real estate, we buy in Texas, Kansas, and the Carolinas. Okay. So those were the easiest ways to connect with people in those markets. I just literally look up the directory who's buying there, give them a call, and they just included me in their groups and their pods um, into their Zoom calls. And that's how I started underwriting, learning the market, learning how they do, how they purchase, and 
approximately eight months after, yeah, I picked up my first multifamily and nice. resigned nice. from my W2. Let me ask you this real quick. What, why did you pick those three markets or four markets? Yeah, well, initially I wanted to buy in Florida because yeah. I knew people there. Florida is way too hot. I couldn't find anything even remotely close uh, to, uh, to, to a deal, something that made sense. Yeah, nothing. And then insurance started to skyrocket because mm. of the uh, hurricanes. Yep. Uh, so we started to, there. isn't it, is, hasn't it always been high? I guess it's just gotten higher and no, higher. It's it just, it literally, I think, doubled. Mm. Yeah, it's pretty Man, bad. oh man. Uh, so we picked the Carolinas because we, after eight months speaking with the same people, pretty much, I really got to know them. They were buying in the Carolinas. We looked up the market. I mean, the, it's very hot, a lot of movement there. If you look at the data and uh, how people are migrating, they all, a lot of them are going south. It's very landlord friendly. It's, it's same as Texas because you see it's a lot of petrochemical industry. You have microchip companies. You have Tesla, a lot of big companies moving out of New York opening up offices in Texas. It's it's a booming, booming place. So that's why we picked those places. And uh, from, I don't know, two years now, we buying in those markets, yeah. Nice, okay, very cool. So you, you, you started working with Jake and Gino and you started networking with other investors and you got involved in their groups and in their circles. And um, so was your first deal in, in the multifamily space, was it with partners? Was it by yourself? Where was it? Tell us about that. Yeah, I, I wanted to do it by myself, but shortly after realized that it was in, literally impossible. Uh, <laughs> not that I, I just can't see it because if I'm in Jersey, how can I possibly buy something in a different state? So of course right. I partner up with people. Um, I, I vetted my partners for over eight months and my first syndication that I was involved in it was a, a pretty big purchase. It was 200 doors in San Antonio. Okay. And yeah, I, I, I got to know uh, the main sponsors, uh, spoke with them daily, and uh, we really liked each other. And they're like, hey, listen, why don't you just uh, try to raise capital for us and be on like investor relations person and be a co-GP? And that's how exa that's exactly how it happened. Okay. Very cool. Tell us a little bit about the deal itself, that deal. Like, I'm just curious. So you were doing real, you, you were doing real estate in terms of local as an agent via brokerage. You started doing some fix and flips and some wholesaling. And, um, and then you decided, Hey, I want to get into the multifamily space. And then how, so it took about eight months from the time that you kind of started navigating that to finding these people, I would imagine, or roughly maybe five, six months. Yeah, I would say eight months or so. Once eight I months or so. Cool. So then yeah. you found them and then they were like, hey, um, you know, we got this deal. And you're like, great, because it's impossible for me to do this by myself. Yeah. And you guys started working together. And then, you know, what were they pitching you on? What were they trying to pitch the investors on and then get you to help them do? How did all that work? Yeah, they, they just said, hey, listen, uh, this is the deal. It was $18 million purchase, 200 doors in San Antonio. And uh, they're like, can you raise capital? And I was so bold and I was like, yeah, of course, no problem. Uh, I can raise a million. And they're like, really? Is that your first raise and you're just going for a million? How uh, bullish are you when it comes to... I'm like, yeah, I thought it was so easy. They're like, you know what? How about this? You try 500,000. And then if you get anything higher than that, it's just a bonus. So yep. okay. go well, that's that. That's good that they were kind of just like, hey, let's pump the brakes a little and just... yeah. Got it. So how did it work out for you? Yeah. So believe it or not, I raised more than a million. Nice. Um, not a single uh, of my friend invested in me because they still thought of me as graphic designer. Yeah, which, uh, they, which isn't uncommon. You know, yeah. they want to see you do a couple times, probably, exactly. most likely. Okay. Yeah, they, they, they're like, hey, listen, is this like your hobby or whatever? So what I what I started to do is educating them on multifamily and real estate. So all they hear from me is real estate related news. Mm -hmm. And slowly but surely, it took time. It took six months extra for them to be like, oh, okay, so I guess Vlad knows what he's talking about, right? Mm -hmm. So, but how I got uh, uh, over 1 million on that uh, deal, I was, oh, it was 506C, 
So I was advertising it everywhere. And I was on all the Zoom calls, right? I was like on five Zoom calls a day, a day. And there was this guy who had a 1031. And he yep. really liked the deal. And he invested his 1031 into that deal. That's exactly how it, how it was. So basically, a uh, few investors, mainly this one person that, you know, went above and beyond and, you know, helped. And he was out. a stranger to you. Yeah, completely strange, complete stranger. And, and, and what kind of a call were you on that, that connected the two of you? Was it like, uh, was it a call that you were hosting or was it somebody else's call or, you know, tell us a little bit it, about It was that. somebody else's call. It was just purely educational call um, on, I think on Tuesday at eight o'clock, I was just, uh, somebody was talking about lending or something like that. It was no big deal. Just a regular Zoom educational call and there was breakout sure. rooms. And during the breakout rooms, um, uh, they're like, so what do you do? And I told them, and they kind of just threw the deal in there that we are looking to close within a few months. He had to identify, you know, the next deal because of the 1031 ID window. And he's like, I'm considering a few more, but let, let me look at yours. Send me your numbers. Well, I did. Uh, of course, we jumped on a Zoom call privately. Then the sponsors came in on a call and we all spoke. He even flew to texas to take a look at the place nice and he, liked so he wanted to do his due diligence and whatnot he did. Mm -hmm. and okay. uh you know he vetted the sponsor and you know it went forward i i really liked it yeah that's so how does it work for thing. all of the listeners here today that um you know maybe new or even experienced but don't have a ton of experience specifically in the whole syndication side of the business can you explain and break down, you know, what syndication is, what it means and how it works? Yeah, it's basically a group of people getting together to buy something okay, uh, or invest into something. We okay. all see syndications. Uh, we just we just kind of ignore it. When you starting to watch a movie, for example, right in the beginning of the movie, you see, for example, like all these MGM Sony popping up, right? Yep. Those are companies that get together, pool their money together, and make a movie, and then they share a profit when the movie releases in the movie theater. That is it's such cool. a great, you know, um, example. That is yeah. such a great example. Movies, because look movie at the credits at the end of the movie. How many people are in the credits? I mean, there's thousands, right? Yeah. You know, so that's a that is such a great example. So it's it's a group of people that get together, pool their funds, to then go buy and or invest into into uh in my case a big apartment project so could be businesses yeah. could be movies could be yeah. real estate could be apartments. it can be it, it can be a car like a very expensive car like a ferrari right. or something yep so, i used to be in a flight club where we would we would have you know 30 or 40 people and we'd share like six planes and we yeah. all it's the same thing right we're just syndicating we're pooling our resources to all be able to you know achieve something greater than exactly. ourselves and what we can yeah. do on our and own. some okay. people are active and some people are passive, which is perfectly okay. So the active are the sponsors or syndicators. They put their own money in the deal as well. And we run it. We run the deal. So we make sure we paint it, we fix it, we speak. So there was some there. rehab or some renovation or upgrading yeah. and updating that was needed on this building. Is that typically what you're looking for is value add plays? Yeah. Okay. We look at value add opportunities. I would say something B, C class. Uh, 1985 vintage, uh, big metroplexes, uh, to add some value, of course, hike up the rents and, uh, hold it for five years. That's our typical hold five years, five years. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And then is there an, so then the exit would be either a sale or a refinance. Is that how that works? Or? Uh, it, in 90% of the cases, it's a sale. Typically okay. we try to refi it year three. But mm. we don't know how the rates are. You see right. the rates jumped up significantly. So if somebody put refi in their pro forma a few years ago, they can't refi now. So their numbers are all screwed up. So what we do now is we fix our rate. We get we get Freddie or agency debt. We lock it for five years, actually for seven years in the previous case. Mm -hmm. And we just literally pay out monthly distributions to our passive investors, approximately 7% we're targeting on the previous deal. Okay. And uh, when we sell, they're looking to 2X their money. So if they invest 100,000, they're looking to get $200,000.
Nice. That's awesome. And then they're also getting the advantages of owning real estate, right? So they're getting some depreciation yeah. every year. And Absolutely. Yeah. We cost segregate. We do cost segregation study, which is we depreciate the building and approximately 65% of the investment, they'll get a K-1 form every single year. And all those profits of gains are technically tax-free. I mean, it varies, but in many, many cases, they're completely tax-free. Yeah. Nice, nice. Until the building sells and then they have to recapture, you're saying, right? Uh, well, it, it depends on their tax strategies. Uh, in many cases, they roll over. Uh, if you, it, it depends how you invest with just cash or self-directed IRAs or 401ks or 1031s. True, true. Uh, there, there are recaptures. Yeah, absolutely. But it, every, every situation is different. Everybody's uh, like, if you are tax, per, if you are a real estate professional, then you can write off more. If you're not, then it's a little bit of a different write-off. But yeah, oh, that absolutely. makes sense. Okay. Yeah. I was just, I'm aware. I just wanted to make sure the audience here. Yeah. was aware. Amazing. Yeah. So let's talk about, you know, how you guys make money as the syndicators and the general partners. So you basically, you have general partners and you have limited partners. And most yeah. of the investors I'd imagine are the limited partners. Yeah. And then you have the general partner. So what does the general partner typically contribute? And then what kind of percentages are they taking of the deal versus the limited partners? Yeah, limited partners get paid first. So it's okay. a 70 30 split in, in this particular case. So 70% goes to limited partners. Um, after we reach a certain, uh, let's say, gain or IRR, then the splits change. Okay. They, they change to, let's say, 50 50, but mostly okay. 70 30 up until we reach a certain threshold. And what is so, that threshold typically? I know it can vary, of course. It, it varies. We, we but on this deal like we're talking about, what was it? 15. 15 IRR. 15%. Yeah. And, okay. Yeah. And then it splits 50-50. But at the end, the return that we were targeting is 18. So, Got you it. know, it's uh, it's even higher return. So, okay. yeah, we, we get, let's say, the acquisition fee of 2% because we have to pay attorneys, right? We have to pay ourselves, our bookkeepers, things like that. Mm -hmm. So we get an acquisition fee. And of course, we have to run the place, right? We have to manage it. We have, we're speaking with the property manager. We have to execute on our performer. So we take a small cut. And then uh, when we sell, uh, there's a small fee as well. Uh, typically, there is like 1% fee on a refi, but since we don't refi, that kind of goes away. At the end, there's a, um, you know, when we sell, there is a fee because we put all this work into it, right? Sure. So passive investors literally just sitting there sleeping and collecting money. They're collecting $8,000 a year for doing absolutely nothing, for just putting their money in there, and then they get a big check at the end of five years, right? Mm -hmm. And they can do whatever they want. We have to actually perform on this. Sure. So that's why we get uh, like small distributions of payments um, throughout the year or an acquisition or distribution. Yeah, but those are tiny comparing to, you know, the overall potential of the property. Yeah. Right. No, that makes perfect sense. Okay, cool, man. Well, hey, all the above sounds awesome. So what else are you working on right now? How many of these have you done? Have you only got one done? Are you working on a couple more? No, right no, now? I've done, I've done, uh, I worked on four syndications. Uh, nice, that's great, yeah. man. Yeah, and uh, I also have four JV deals. JV is joint venture. That's where all active investors pool their money together. It's a small group of people. So it's not a general partner and a limited partner with the yeah, JV deals. In the it's JV, just, it's, it's all. It's just, hey, you got 10% of the money. You're in for 10% of the deal, right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So those are typically smaller deals, like one to $2 million deals. You okay. have five people pulling their money together, all active operators. And we execute. There is no, there's nobody passive in this, in our case. Right. Uh, but like, I'm just going to talk about the deal that we closed uh, 30 days ago. It's in Dallas, in South Dallas. There was seven uh, 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 GPs and then few co-GPs as well, raised capital, working on investor relations. And then there's about 60, I would say. Uh, no, no, there's less. There's 40. 40 limited yeah. partners? 
Yeah, limited partners. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, because the raise was not as huge, but it, you know, there it is what it is. On a pre on a deal that we closed in November, it was $52 million, 419 doors. It was a lot more that we needed to do on there. Yeah, got it. So it's so, a much larger deal. Let me ask you this. I got I got a couple questions here. So yeah. Like on this 200 unit one that you had mentioned earlier, that was, I think, what, 16 or 18 million? That was one yeah, of the first million. ones. 18 million. Got it. Okay. And um, you had mentioned that these, you know, were kind of dated. So, like, what's the plan to go in and update these units, especially if they're all, you know, mostly occupied? I'd imagine you're buying properties that are already performing or at least yes. can cover the mortgage, right? Yes. Okay. And Absolutely. that's the beautiful thing about we, real estate is, is that yeah, you can... we typically go for like 90% occupancy so we can get agency debt. Um, so when, and when you say is... agency debt, are you referring to like the government? Yeah. Freddie, Freddie. We talk about Freddie. So it's non-recourse debt. Yes. Got it. Absolutely. Okay. And how long do those loans typically take? Aren't, aren't those, don't those loans take like eight months to a year to just even get through the, through the finish line? No, they're actually pretty quick. Loan okay. assumptions sometimes do, but get Freddie. I don't know. Uh, last time it took two months. That's it. That's it. That's not bad at all. Holy it's cow. Not bad at all. So what kind of, like, are you working? How, so where would one go? And I know this is, this is definitely off topic just for a second here, but where would one go to get a non-recourse loan through Freddie? Is there, yeah, is there it, lots it, of lenders it, it, out there or? Yeah, there's so many lenders out there, brokers. Okay. We typically go to a broker that shops around for the best deal. Uh, like it depends also on the size. So if it's, let's say, a few million dollars, it's better for you to go to a local bank, let's say a community bank or something like that. Sure, sure. Uh, that's when our purchase in Kansas City, we went to a local community bank. We got the best deal ever with, with like a great rate. But if, the, if it's so huge that, let's say, like $50 million acquisition, then you won't be able to just, you know, not walk into normal people. banks. You're going to need to go yeah, somewhere you, bigger. You got, you right? got to go big. You got to go Freddy. You got to go agency okay. uh, or bridge, but bridge was, is, is not a good option right now because uh, rates are so high. Yeah. Bridge is very high because number one, the sulfur is at what four plus you got a lot of risk on top of that. So we in double digits now. So at, as per not me, but Neil Bauer and his numbers, uh, bridge market is kind of dead now. So yeah, it, you have to wait till you know everything kind of stabilizes and the banks come down. Yeah, until the rates are are yeah. back into the into the area. So I I have a bunch. Of, I have about sixty single family homes that I own to rent out, and over the last couple, you know, over the last year, these rates are really squeezing us landlords. And you know, we're still cash flowing, but we're we're cash flowing a third of what we were, maybe even less on some of these properties. So yeah, it's, you know, def changing market conditions can definitely alter and change, you know, the trajectory of our businesses, which is, you know, which is kind of wild, but it is, that's just the way it is. So yeah, especially when stuff moves so quickly, if it's, mm. move, if it's moving slowly, let's say like 25 basis points here and there coming up. But if you look at last year, they jump up 75, then it was 50 basis points it was just jumps every single it was month. going every every month or every six weeks it was going up. yeah like we went the whole from point. two or three to nearly six yep we doubled in in what is it eight months now so it, it nobody's seen uh such a significant jump so quickly so the adjustment is not there it takes some time for sellers to adjust to the new conditions and of course we want to buy we can't buy anymore because look at the rates and the sellers are oh, look at our properties, look at our deals. I'm like, they're not deals anymore. Can't buy them. So mm. interesting. Very interesting. Okay. Well, what's new? What's next for you, Vlad? It sounds like you have a very, really interesting story where you just got started a couple of years ago and you started as an agent and then you kind of moved into the investor space and then you were a landlord and did some wholesaling. And then you decided, I don't even want to do any of this stuff anymore. I just want to go do big deals yeah. and I want to help raise the money and syndicate. Is that the focus at this point? That's the focus. Yeah, I'm growing my brand. In addition, I am focusing, we're underwriting a lot. We underwrite, I would say, uh, 20 deals a week. Holy cow. Maybe, yeah. So now what do you mean said, by you underwrite 20 deals a week? You're just looking at the numbers and seeing if it makes sense or not. And yeah, then the ones exactly. that do, you dive deeper. And the ones that don't, 
you just try to make another offer or just push them aside to, to, to circle back later? Yeah. So what we do is we basically look at our criteria. If, for example, I'll just give you an example. If the purchase price versus asking price or our offer price within 20% range, we will actually call the broker back and give them feedback. Uh, or uh, another thing. Another and are most of the deals you're getting, they're coming from brokers? Uh, yeah, there's brokers and direct to seller. I go direct to seller. I have a friend that's working with me as well. He's calling brokers. So we come. You're doing both. both. You're hitting them both ways. Yeah, because remember, I used to be a wholesaler and a flipper. So how do flippers find deals? Going direct to seller. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're always going to get the best deal, most likely going direct to the seller, but not always, you know, but yeah, typically speaking. So let me ask you this real quick, too. Are you guys using creative financing or seller financing or subject to or anything like that with these these bigger deals? Oh, yeah, absolutely. The deal that we closed in November, we did a loan assumption of 2.9%. Oh, that's a great deal. Somebody's loan. And I'll give you another way. But when but you're you, talking assuming it though, so they're actually off the loan. You guys, yeah, they off over. the loan. We assume that we assume their loan. We put some pref equity on top, um, and then we raise the rest. Got when, it. When you're dealing with, uh, let's say, business people that are in multifamily space, they offer you seller financing. They offer to carry a note. You don't have to pitch it because I know when you talk about hybrids and subject twos to single family space. People don't know. They really don't know. All they know is convention, conventional way of buying a per, or selling, sure. showing sure. to a bank, getting sure. a loan. That's it. Right. When you have all these creative uh, strategies, I mean, Pace Morby is one of them, uh, is uh, doing crazy stuff when it comes to hybrid. He is. He is doing crazy stuff. I've met Pace a few times, and yeah. I actually was started reading his book last night. Yeah. So he is definitely he, an impressive, he's unbelievable. And you don't have to guy. convince multifamily operators right. for this. They're offering you this. In fact, right now, when we're speaking with brokers, they're like, seller can carry a loan uh, of 40% or carry a note for 40%. Oh, you can assume a loan. You can do like a subject to type of deal on this. They're mm. actually giving it. So to the you brokers are talking to their clients about selling their property for them. And then they're actually asking, hey, you know, give me some, give me some, some things to help, help sell it. Right. And then yeah. the sellers will then say, okay, cool. Yeah, no problem. We'll, we'll be interested in carrying back 20% or seller financing the whole deal or whatever they may be interested in. So the broker's actually presenting these options to you when they're presenting the deal, right? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. That's they, awesome. Without even us asking for it, because the rates are high. Now the leverage is really low. Before we would buy in what, like 80% leverage. Now it's 60. So mm. you got to raise more money. But the, our biggest bottleneck is equity, right? Raising a lot of capital. Like we're looking to buy a, a building now. We submitted an LOI. We're going to have to raise $16 million. It's a big raise, right? Are it's, you guys typically raising like 20 or 30 or 40% of the cash and then using leverage for the difference? What is the, yes. what, what's the number? Typically. Yeah, we, we're looking to raise approximately 30%. 30%? Uh, on a yeah. previous deal, we got 65% loan to cost. Uh, we have to, we put some own money in. So we're looking to raise, I don't know, like 40%. because 30 to 40%. To yeah. Yeah. You need closing fees, of course, and some stuff for the CapEx. So yeah, we, we have to raise a lot of money. And uh, raise have been challenging, especially in Q1 because it's tax season, right? A lot mm -hmm. of people don't know how their taxes are going to be. So, but typically as you see stuff opening up, you know, people are not that scared anymore and they see the potential and opportunities. And when they know that you can invest from 401k, self-directed IRAs, um, you know, the solo 401ks, I mean, anything, then they're like, oh, wow, we didn't know that. I'm like, well, there you go. There you go. Yeah. It gives them much more options. That, that's yeah. pretty awesome, man. That's really cool. Very cool. Well, Vlad, what um, there's there's people listening right now and they're like, hey, this is actually kind of cool. you right. You know, this I didn't even know this was a thing. Right. We've had a couple syndicators on the show before, but um, in the event that somebody does have some money laying around and they're wanting to invest it into, you know, one of these deals, like what what's next? How do they reach you? How do they learn about you know, some of some of the things that you're maybe trying to raise capital for, like what's a great way to connect with you or reach out to you or learn more about 
you know, you, sure. my, my friend. Yeah, I, listen, I'm all over social media. Vlad Arakchev. I have a very unique name. I'm on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. Uh, Go ahead and spell that for the audience, because there might be somebody driving right now that's like, wait, hold on. So Vlad, V-L-A-D, we know that. Spell your last name for me. Arakchev is A-R-A-K-C-H-E-Y-E-V. Um, and uh, you can Perfect. go to zanticventures.com. I, uh, you know, you can take a look at what we offer. I mean, when we when we have a deal, most of the investors that we dealt with before reinvest their capital. That's because cool. We're very, very, very selective when it comes to deal. I know you hear it from everyone when they say, "Oh, we underwrite conservative." I'll give you one more thing: how we underwrite. Yeah, sure. With every deal, we try to kill it, literally. And Which is good, though, because you're kind of you're trying to pierce holes in it, right? Yes. So if we cannot kill it, we in it. Out of 20 deals that we looked at, that somebody pitched to us, that we saw, we literally killed them all except for one. So forget about exclusivity. I'm going for quality. I'm not sure. going for quantity here. I need top people top returns because i'm going for top markets top areas top syndicators i'm not like i'm not working with everyone i work with two groups and i know them i vet them i know them for for let's say more than a year now mm -hmm. so i'm very comfortable working with them i like their work ethic I like how they present themselves as professionals. They're not blasting stuff all over Facebook and we're getting Facebook deals. Absolutely not. Vertically integrated. Got their own, uh, got their own uh, property management teams. Very hyper-focused on the market. Right? How do you guys so handle the rehabs when you're dealing with multiple states, multiple cities within each state? You know, and you got, you got Let's say you go buy a 200-unit building like your original example here. And it's 90% occupied, right? And it needs updating. Like all 200 new units are going to typically need to be touched, right? Or are you not even doing uh, typically that? Typically, we update about 70% and then leave the rest for the new buyer. For the That's new. So, you, okay. So you're leaving a little value add, a little yeah, for them. For somebody else. But so you're trying to update 70% roughly. And then what? So how does that work? You just do it as people move out? Or yeah. Yep, and just work yeah, around in many the existing cases, tenants. We do as people move out because okay. we tr we we send them you know a renewal for the for the leases, and if they choose not to renew, they move out. We immediately turn the unit. We put approximately in the previous case sixteen thousand dollars. So we put sixteen thousand in each unit. Yeah, give okay. or take. Uh, we put washer dryers, hookups. We put. Yeah, we put uh, light fixtures. In many cases, we renew the kitchens, we redo the countertops, we fix the fixtures, things like that. So we really spruce up the place. How much, in, in terms of percentages? And this is a hard, this is a hard question to answer. But just do your best here. How yeah. much, in terms of percentages, are you as are you essentially? And I know it varies, of course, on the rehab and the market and the price point. I get there's a lot of factors here, but on average. You know, whenever you go in and you do like, let's say a $16,000 renovation on an apartment unit, you know, at yeah. the particular unit, well, how much will you raise the rents in terms of percentages? Yeah, I'll give you a numbers example. Uh, okay. So the previous, uh, I'm talking about the previous, the previous deal, the rents were $700. If the person stays there, we can raise it by $50 increments. We don't want to go too much because oh, maybe- You don't want to vacate more. the whole building. Yeah. Yeah. We don't, want to, revenues, we don't want to do that. But you don't want to get a bunch of vacancies all right at the same time. Yeah, right? but we are targeting actually to do a $200 increase. So how long will that take? Is that four months, six months, a year? You know what? We sent renewals in batches. So it depends on the size of the property. So we send out, let's say 20 at a time. Yeah. And see how it is. We send 20, then we wait, see how many people move out so we yep. can do the turns. Then we send 20 again. We send 20 again. If a lot of people are moving out, we're holding it back a little so we can have occupancy up there. So we still cash flowing. Because don't forget, we are just we're doing distributions monthly starting from day one. So we closed on the property in March. We're starting distributions after the first month of operations. So distributions are starting now. So okay. we need to make sure that the occupancy stays above, let's say, our target. Well, our target is 70%, but that's above 90. So that's what we target. We like 
just to to do distributions immediately because that attracts a lot of investors and uh, that shows the stability of the property so yeah uh like in Kansas City when we bought uh the building the rents were 500 bucks we're looking to hike them up to 900 nearly double because I found that property off market completely off market and the seller really old person he was like 75 ish somewhere around there he just didn't want to deal with it anymore so he literally gave it to us as 50 at 50,000 per door meanwhile average price is 80,000 per door so we literally got a, an enormous discount on that property and we can hike it up to 900 bucks two two bedrooms we can hike it up even more but what I want to go over because we you know we we just don't want to be cruel to tenants we, of course we like them but if nobody's moving out we're doing external upgrades paint we improving dog parks we're removing some trees because the roots were damaging the pipes and damaging foundation uh curb appeal new signage uh we improving laundry rooms also new management office so we improving the building new lighting leds uh also there's some rails broken so we overall improving the property so tenants would get what they pay for in the yeah, so you're justifying these rent rates yeah. uh, rent increases a lot of tenants i should are say going like this like oh our toilets are clogged up all the time or there's like rodents running around or there's like infestations and we're like who wants to live in 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 an infested building I yeah don't. let's go in let's fix it up let's raise the rents accordingly and you yeah. know obviously they're gonna get something better above and beyond what they're currently getting to justify these rent rates of course I mean awesome. people would like they can pay more but they have to see what they're paying for right yeah so if you're paying for beautiful lights for beautiful if you're just raising lights, the rents without any updates then they're going to no, say well you know, I mean, maybe you, maybe you not and they may bounce the out pride in that place right. like we want people to walk in and and, and go like this is our place this Be is where we want to live it. I love yeah it. so that that's and our that, goal that's awesome Vlad it's been awesome having you I've learned a lot you're very knowledgeable you have an awesome level of passion and enthusiasm about this and um you're already having awesome success and I'm confident that you're going to keep growing and keep building and and having more and more success um if anybody wants to reach out to you and park or place some capital into one of your deals um zonticventures.com is that the best place to go yeah you can go to zontic ventures you can dm me pm me whatever you do and <laughs> plus if you google my name i'm a real estate agent my information pops up it's it's all online right it's all online so i'm i'm here at least if you want to know how to let's say get started reach mm -hmm. out to me i might be able to connect you with some people or at least point you in a, in in the right direction because i know it might seem intimidating but it really isn't if you really want to put the hard work in and educate yourself education I think it's crucial here it's very important to educate yourself man I love it I love it well Vlad it's been a pleasure thanks for being a guest on my show guys check it out Zontic Ventures and I'm going to spell that for anybody that's you know driving or out jogging or whatnot and they're not able to to you know to to see this right away it's Zontic is z-o-n-t-i-k ventures v-e-n-t-u-r-e-s dot com and down below this episode we'll have some show notes there'll be some links to connect with vlad via email his website um and just you know some more information about his bio um vlad any parting words for the audience today my man yeah you know believe in yourself that's the mm -hmm. most important thing do not have doubts if you have doubts get them out of your head the only <laughs> thing that's stopping you no really the only thing that's stopping you is this your mind your brain is you is the only thing that's stopping you work on your mind fix it and everything else will follow so yeah believe in yourself and go for it man I 100 percent agree Vlad it's been a pleasure thanks for being a guest on the show guys check it out look at the show notes below go reach out Vlad's here to help he is uh rocking and rolling raising money doing deals helping other investors out there park cash and put money to work so they can have some passive income too and uh, again, Vlad, thanks for being here, brother. Signing off. Of course. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the Discount Property Investor Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, share, and subscribe to help us reach a wider audience. To jumpstart your real estate investing career, 
please visit freewholesalecourse.com, the most complete free course on wholesaling real estate ever. We would also appreciate it if you left us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. Thank you in advance for your support. And remember, you make your money when you buy and you get paid when you sell. Now let's go build some wealth.